Here's another story I've been waiting to redo for a while, y'all, about R&B singer Tony Thompson and the High Five group, right? Because you know, when it comes to that 90s wave of boy bands coming in, High Five was one of the groups that helped pave the way. But first off, let's give credit when credit is due, right? Because a lot of those groups, they model themselves after the Jackson 5 and Michael Jackson. And before that, it was the Ink Spots and Frankie Lyman and Teenagers and the Temptations and all of them, right? The list goes on. And High Five and Tony Thompson was about to do the same thing. So who was the greatest five-member boy band of all time? You got the Jackson 5, like I said, the Osmonds, the Teenagers, like I said earlier, Frankie Lyman and them. New Edition, New Kids on the Block, uh, 98 Degrees, NSYNC, Backstreet Boys. And then if you want to bring it to the R&B side of the five member boy bands, Blackstreet, Silk, Troop, Foursome D's, and there's a whole bunch of other ones I can mention. But High Five, that was my era. They took the world by storm because they could dance, sing. They had the fashion because, look, they would wear the street clothes and then change it up and switch it up to to wearing suits. And look, they would sign the Jive records first. And when they left Jive, that's when Jive signed Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. And they used the high five wave that made them some of the biggest boy bands to ever do it. High five was the first on Jive. And Tony Thompson, he influenced a whole bunch of artists with his voice, had his own style. The fans would never, ever forget him. He was the heart of High Five. And you know, let's get to his story, man. Let's get to the Tony Thompson story right now. Tony Thompson was born on September 2nd, 1975 in Waco, Texas. Now, growing up, at a very young age, he started singing in the youth choir at his church. And he became so popular that words started spreading around about this young kid with a big voice. And once that happened, that's when he told his family he wanted to become a professional singer. After that, he started singing everywhere he could, showing his skills like talent shows. He would do special events in the town and he will always win the contest. He was always winning the contest and he used to compete against some other guys who were much older than him at that time. But those guys ended up getting the record deal first with Jive Records and they called themselves a door. They were actually the first group from Waco, Texas to get a deal. And one of the members of the group named William Walton, uh, he admired Tony's talent. And he promised to help him once they get situated. And he kept his promise. He kept his promise and hooked Tony up. And he got him an audition with some music managers from New York named Vinnie Bell and Robert Ford, who at the time was looking for some young talent. They were they was looking for someone who sounded similar to Michael Jackson because they really wanted to put a five member group together like the Jackson Five in New Edition. And after meeting Tony, they loved his voice and they decided to work with him. And they had asked Tony, do he know any other singers? That's when Tony brought in his friends, Toriano Easley, who he knew from Oklahoma. And look, Toriano was just as good as Tony. He had a big voice too. And then he brought in Russell Neal and they started calling themselves the Playmates, right? It was just them, it was just them three at first. They were the group, Tony Thompson, Toriano, and Russell Neal. And they did a demo, but when the record company heard the demo, they weren't really feeling the sound they had. And that's when they added Pooh and Marcus to the group for the Playmates. And once Vinnie Bell got all the paperwork straight with the courts, because all of them were young, they was like 15, 16 years old. So their parents had to be involved. But once all the legal stuff was straight, they became part of the Jive Records family. 
and later would become the first singing group to release music on Jive Records. I mean, like I said earlier, Jive Records, they had signed a group of Door, who Tony and them knew from their hometown. They were actually the first R&B group on Jive, but they never just put, they put, they didn't put nothing out. And Jive, and Jive also had, they had R&B singers like Millie Jackson and Billy Ocean before, but they never had an R&B group release any material. That's why they signed them. And they also had to change their name from the Playmates to High Five because they say Hugh Hefner, who owned Playboy magazine, owned the rights to the name The Playmates. Now, after they started working on their album with their hometown friend, William Walton, who was in the group of Door, right? He did a lot of writing for him. William, William Walton did a lot of writing for them, and they would work with a bunch of other well-known songwriters and producers too. And they released their first single titled, I Just Can't Handle It, which hit number 10 on the R&B charts and was produced by Teddy Riley. But right after the video started to heat up, on September 1st, 1990, Toriano Easley ended up catching a murder charge. Now, the story goes with that incident. Toriano said he had got into an argument with someone back in his hometown in Oklahoma. And while fighting, the gun he had somehow went off and shot the guy in the stomach and killed him. And he was charged with first degree murder. And he ended up doing like six out of 10 years in prison because it was self-defense. But I think he had to do time for the gun or whatever. After that, they needed to find another member now for the group because the name was High Five and it just didn't look right with four members. So Jive Records had auditions and everything trying to find another teenage singer, but no one impressed them. And that's when they ended up adding a 16 year old gospel singer named Treston Irby to the group who Vinnie Bell saw at a Bronx, New York talent show during a Christmas concert. And Tristan, he sung for him a cappella in the car. And you know what? The rest is history. He was now part of the group. And days later, on September 25th, 1990, they released their debut album. And their second single psh, is the one that took them to another level. Y'all know what that was. I like the way the kissing game. Kissing Game went number one on the Hot R&B Hip Hop Songs charts and number one on the Billboard Hot 100 charts and was certified platinum. Teddy Riley co-wrote and produced that song too. Look, when that song hit, it was an anthem. It was an anthem. It was the anthem of the year and it took them all around the world. They was in Japan. They was doing Sprite commercials and everything. I'm still playing that song to this day. Still hot. Now, the third single was called I Can't Wait Another Minute. And that hit number one also on the U.S. R&B chart. And hit number eight on the U.S. pop chart. Now, the crazy thing about that song, right? The group really didn't believe the song would be a big hit. And they really wanted another up-tempo song as their next single. But I Can't Wait Another Minute crossed them over into the pop genre. That was my junk right there. I love that song too. It take me back, man, to school dances in middle school because <laughs> the girls used to love that song. But anyway, now, and look, and look, in the video, they had Tristan Irby lip sync Toriano hook part. Toriano sung the hook before he got locked up. Now, another song on that album was called Too Young. And that song was in the movie uh, Boys in the Hood. If y'all remember when um, Doughboy had got out of jail, when he got older, they had the barbecue. You can hear it in the background. But Too Young was on the soundtrack of the Boys in the Hood movie, right? And guess who was rapping on that song? Prodigy from Mob Deep. Wow. But look, he was going by the name Lord T, the golden child at the time, and he was 15 years old. That's crazy, man. He spoke about that in his book, too, which is a great book. 
Make sure y'all pick up that Prodigy book. But anyway, all those singles they released off that album helped push the album to certified platinum. And they were on fire at the time in the industry. They was on fire. Like I said, right? They were in demand and the fans couldn't get enough of them. They was torn all across the world. Artists like Salt and Pepper, Tony, 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 Troop, Father MC, LL Cool J, Ice Cube, BBD, and many more. And remember, they were teenagers too. They were still teenagers. They were still in high school, so they had to bring tutors on the road with them. Now with a successful album, it was time to start working on their second album. But this time around, they wanted more say-so and control of their careers at this point. So they ended up firing their managers, Vinnie Bell and Robert Ford. Now, Tristan, now Tristan Irby said he didn't, he didn't want to fire them because they were the ones that found him in New York and added him to the group. But he was outvoted by the rest of the guys. And after firing them, they made their role manager, Jonathan Kenlock, their full-time manager. After that, the next thing they did, right, they wanted to go to the label and find out why they weren't making no money because they were like the top group in the world at the time, the hottest group, but they won't get no money. And the powers that be at Jive Records told them that they were in the red. They haven't recouped yet because they still owe the label a lot of money for all their expenses. I mean, they had credit cards. They were just using the credit cards and everything. They had to pay their credit cards back, hotel rooms, clothes, food, all a lot of living expenses. That's what the uh, label told them. But Russell Neal, now Russell Neal, he wasn't having it. He wanted the label to sit down with everybody and show them where the money was going and teach them about the business. And look, Russell told the rest of the guys, if they don't school them about how the business work, then they shouldn't perform. But the other members didn't want to go along with his plan. So you know what? Russell Neal decided to leave the group. And on August 11th, 1992, they released their second album titled Keep It Going On, which also went certified platinum. And the single She's Playing Hard To Get hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100 and number two on the R&B singles chart. That was my junk right there, too. And if you notice in that video, <laughs> you don't see no Russell Neal. Russell Neal wasn't in there. He wasn't in that video. But right after that, they faced another tragedy when Pooh ended up paralyzed from a car accident. Now, the story goes, they say they were on I-95 going to a radio station in Florida for their promotional tour and, and somebody hit them in the back and the van ended up flipping over or something like that. So everybody got out and they checked their stuff, they wasn't hurt. But when it was Pooh turn to get out, he said he couldn't feel his legs. Man, that's sad, man. That's terrible, man. And he ended up being paralyzed from the chest down, never ever to walk again. So sad, man. And look, that incident just messed, it messed everybody up. They was young, man. They didn't know how to really process that, man. That was really the beginning of the group's downfall because to deal with the pain of their friend Pooh not walking again, they say this, it was messing with drugs and alcohol and a bunch of stuff man after that Pooh now paralyzed from the neck down he had asked Russell Neal as a favor to him to come back and join the group and Russell agreed to do it for Pooh and that's when they released their next single called Quality Time which hit number 3 on the Billboard's R&B chart and number 38 on the Billboard Hot 100 chart now that song was produced by r kelly they was working with a young r kelly at that time who was still with the group public announcement wow 
That was my junk too. Quality time, that was a hit, man. I wish Tony and R. Kelly would have collaborated more. Ain't no telling what kind of music they would have put out to the world. But you know, R. Kelly also wrote some more songs on the album. One called uh, A Little Bit Older Now. Another another one was called Video Girl. And another one was called um, Let's Get It Started. And another thing about that album, right? R&B singer Faith Evans had made her debut singing background on a song called She Said. Wow. Now, after the success of that album, Keep It Going On, which also ended up going platinum, it was time to start working on a third album. And on October 26, 1993, they released their third and final album titled Faithful, which hit number 105 on the Billboard 200 and a number 23 on Billboard R&B charts, right? And look, they had some good songs on that album too, man. Unconditional Love, which was on the Menace to Society soundtrack, and the song Never Should Have Let You Go was on the Sister Act 2, Back in the Havoc soundtrack. And that song, Never Should Have Let You Go, hit number 30 on the Billboard Hot 100. That was a good song too. I used to like that song too. Now, that album was a great album, like I said, but the label didn't really promote it or push it because the group, they wanted to leave Jive at the time. They was older now and they just felt they could get a better deal somewhere else. That was the last album they was obligated to do with Jive. They had a three album deal when they first signed with them, right? And look, the crazy part is, right, Jive wanted to resign them and everything. They wanted to renegotiate their contract and give Tony a solo deal because Jive looked at them like they was family. But you know, the group was just ready to go, man. They just felt they could get a better deal somewhere else and that's when they ended up signing with Giant Records. And Giant Records ended up giving the group a deal and Tony Thompson a solo deal, which really is what Giant Records wanted to do. They really, Giant Records really wanted to just focus on Tony Thompson album. They really didn't even want to put another group album out. Because like I said, everybody was all in Tony's ear to break away from the group and go solo. A bunch of labels been trying to sign him since the first album blew up. So Giant Records just made an agreement in the deal that Tony Thompson would come out first with his solo album. Then the group will put out an album. And they ended up getting a big signing bonus from Giant Records for about, I think it was, they said in an unsung episode, about $60,000 apiece. And according to Russell Neal, <laughs> what he said in the unsung episode, he said management and the other members of the group tried to cut his money. They wanted to find him because he left the group the first time. They wanted to find him for that and only give him 30,000 out of the 60,000 and Russell Neal wasn't having that so that's when he left the group again but this time it was for good so that's when they replaced him and added two new members named Shannon Gill and Terrence Murphy to the group now 19 years old and with giant records on June 23rd 1995 Tony Thompson he released his only solo album titled Sexational and a lot of people, Giant Records put a lot of work on that album. They they really had faith in that album and they got a lot of people to work with them. Like, look, a lot of people that worked with him on that album later on became big stars like Missy Elliott, the singer Joe, Usher, Faith, Dave Hollister, and many more. And he had some of the top producers for that album. Teddy Riley worked on it, Al B. Shore, Devontae Swing from Jodeci and Puff Diddy did some work on that album too that was man that was a dope album y'all go back and listen to that sensational album when y'all get a chance songs like I Wanna Love Like That that was produced by Babyface and that did that single that was the single and it did hit the top 20 R&B charts and he redid Stevie Wonder's My Sherry Amore Tony's version was dope too Check that album out when y'all get, get a chance. But overall, 
the album flopped though. It didn't do a good job at all on the charts. And once that happened, Giant Records decided to just drop the whole group. Drop all of them. Wow. But I think Giant Records, man, they should have let the group put an album out because Giant Records R&B division was booming at that time. They had Color Me Bad. Uh, they had the girl group J was over there. And uh, and look, and they signed High Five. High Five was just coming off two platinum albums. And Giant Records just dropped them without even giving them a chance because Tony's album flopped. Wow, that's crazy. And you know what? That's when tch, drugs just took over. Drugs took over and Tony was hooked on that cocaine and heroin. And some of the group members say they would try to hide it from the public. But, you know, after the giant records dropped them, they tried to get other deals, you know, other labels and everything. But no one wanted to work with them. And they just went back home. Everybody went back home. But everybody still wanted to work with Tony, though. They still wanted to work with Tony. He was like the Michael Jackson of the group. People was waiting for him to go solo anyway, but people, Tony had no problem getting the deal, and he ended up getting the deal with Bad Boy Records. He ended up signing with Bad Boy Records and working with Puff, but that album never came out, and the rumors were it was because of his drug habit, though. They say the drugs messed up that deal. They say people tried to help him, man, put him in rehab and stuff, but Tony was out of control with it. On the unsung episode, comedian Flex Alexander, who y'all probably know from the show One on One, right? Flex Alexander confirmed that Tony was just too far gone off drugs at that time. But Tony said, look, Tony did an interview with Wendy Williams <laughs> and Wendy Williams was like kind of clowning him saying trying to find track marks on him and all this stuff and but he told her that the reason he left bad boy records was because he wanted to start his own record label and puff wasn't ready for that hmm that's what tony said but anyway so it didn't work out on bad boy records and after that he really got hooked on drugs worse and he became depressed but he did end up starting his own label. He did start his own label called In Depth Records. Now with his own label, Tony wanted to bring the High Five group back, but this time he added all new members. Wow. But here's the thing. He said he went to the original members first and gave them the vision of putting the group back together, but they didn't want to do it. And he was hurt behind that, so... That's when he put a new high five group together. And on October 11th, 2005, he put the album out titled The Return with his new high five group. And look, it featured a bunch of artists from Houston on this album. It was Bun B on there, Paul Wall and Mike Jones and them. And when he released that album though, that's when things got kind of crazy and messy because the original members of the group had to put out a cease and desist letter for legal ownership of the high five name wow and look right the crazy part is tony thompson and his new high five members had did an interview on wendy williams radio show and him and Tristan got into a big argument in front of the whole world man about the high five name that was crazy it's on youtube y'all want to check it out you just look up uh the wendy williams experience it's a radio show she had back in the day but anyway, so that new High Five album that Tony put out on his own label was stopped from distribution of album, CD, and sales. Now, after that, the drugs, the drugs really had Tony, man. He was spiraling out of control. But in 2007, Treston Irby and Marcus Sanders reached out to Tony and they got back together to do a reunion album. They wanted to squash beef and get back to recording another album, which I, I was happy to see that. They had footage of that. I think Tristan got footage of that. And everything was in motion as they planned their comeback. But on June 1st, 2007, 
Tony Thompson was found dead outside of an apartment complex in his hometown in Waco, Texas. Now, the story goes, they say around 10 p.m., two security guards that worked for the apartment complex found Tony's body next to the air conditioning units in the back of the apartments. And apparently, he died from huffing Freon from the air conditioning units. Wow. Man, that's sad, man. Heartbreaking. Every time I hear that story, man, it's, it's just huffing Freon from the air conditioning units. It's terrible, man. To go out like that, man. Now, here's the crazy part, though. The medical examiner who did the autopsy stated that Tony had a history of inhaling Freon and that no other drugs or alcohol were found in his body but they did find methadone in his bloodstream and they say methadone is a drug commonly used to fight heroin addiction so he was fighting to stay clean y'all and get back on track but you know that addiction just had him man and something else man it's just sad that he went out like that man it's terrible man you know um after his death man the group would face some more crazy stuff happening to him it was like the group was cursed or something because look in 2014 russell neal was charged with murder after killing his wife which was the mother of his two kids and the crazy part about that story look he stabbed his wife to death then he locked their two sons in the room and two days later he went to the police station to turn himself in and he told the police that he and his wife had been in an argument and that she might need some medical attention wow and the police went there and found her on the floor man and the kids was locked up in the room mm -mm 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 -mm. crazy man and look right <laughs> They had to put Russell Neal in a mental institution because he started calling himself Jesus Christ, which made him too incompetent to stay in trial. Wow. Hey, y'all can check the video I did a while back about that whole case on my channel, the Russell Neal story, man. Sad, man. I did that girl like that. And look, more tragedy, right? Like I said, people think the group was cursed. In 2009, Tristan Irby was shot five times outside of a nightclub in Connecticut but he survived though he survived and he's doing he's doing big things now man shout out to Tristan man Tristan he just released this book he just released the book called hiatus which is about his life and the high five group so y'all make sure y'all go and support that and buy that I can't wait to read that man so and y'all know Pooh he just died recently at a hospital in Waco, Texas from an infection that spread through his body, which caused him to develop pneumonia. So rest in peace to Pooh, man. He was 49 years old, man. Rest in peace to him, man. And you know, as of today, High Five is still touring with the new members. I know Marcus Sanders and uh, Treston, you know, they still, they got some new members in there. But Shannon Gill's in there. He was, he was in there before. But uh, they still doing good, man. They're keeping Tony Thompson's name and legacy alive, which is good for the fans. Marcus Sanders and Tristan still be doing a lot of interviews. So y'all can check them out on social media and support whatever they got going on. You know what, though? I would love to see a high five movie. I would love to see a biopic about their journey. That would be dope. But like I said, Tristan, he just dropped his book about his life in the group. And I hope Marcus Sanders work on his book because he is the only original member from the beginning that can tell the group's story. Tristan can tell it too, but Marcus can tell it. He was there from the beginning and he was friends with Tony Thompson when he was young. So he was there. He can, I hope he dropped his book, Marcus Sanders. So we shall see Tony Thompson was only 31 years old I still can't get over that man 31 years old rest in peace Tony Thompson 